Um, okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is Marco. I'm the founder of Zamfir. Um, I'm here for um, calling everyone to, to talk about the role of copyleft in crowdsourcing education. And this is a packed, um, the packed discussion, of course. And there are a lot of topics related to education uh, that, that uh, copyleft can influence. Um, but I'm going to start with a few, uh, a few ideas of my own. Uh, if you look at the past of liberating knowledge, you've probably heard about people like um, Aaron Schwartz or Alexandra Elbakian who were prosecuted for uh, liberating knowledge, allowing people to actually access the knowledge. So right now what we have is we have a very well-developed free software movement, a lot of people who are engaged with that movement, but we still fail to apply the similar or same principles to education. Um, as, as the previous lecture also said, universities are very hierarchical um, structures, right, and uh, very related uh, to governments usually um, in most of the countries. So there is this um, overwhelming bureaucracy behind changing curriculums and how they work. And, and um, one, of the, one of the parts um, where copyleft can actually help with access to knowledge is not by um, taking the power away from universities but actually giving it more to the people who actually can contribute. And that's why crowdsourcing is the main topic of what I'm, what I'm trying to talk to um, you about today. One thing is um, copyleft could have prevented um, many people to be prosecuted um, for trying to uh, liberate knowledge. And this is one thing that we have to differentiate. Um, I, I think that we shouldn't call people who liberate knowledge criminals and terrorists um, like we used to in, in, um, before. So the project, I'm, I'm going to just explain it in, in five minutes um, that I'm working on, is called Zamfir. Uh, it's um, trying to take the good parts of free software and apply it to education so we can build a non-institutional um, educational movement that's going to be crowdsourced, peer-reviewed, and eventually come to a point where we have a horizontal platform where we can build a singular global school on top of. This could be useful for various um, organizations, universities, but also you know, hacker spaces, uh, informal groups that just want to um, try to, to learn about a specific topic. Um, and one of the core ideas uh, for us are collaborative open knowledge corpuses. And this is where copyleft comes in. So these knowledge corpuses are designed to get knowledge in one place and allow it to be peer reviewed, uh, allow it to be accessible to everyone. And what this accomplishes is if you look at MOOCs, if you look at different implementations of you know, various uh, educational and e-learning uh, technologies, you'll see that knowledge is often fragmented. You'd see that a lot of times, a couple of universities would have a similar or the same topic, let's say web development, and they, they'd have two courses that are very similar, but yet somewhat different on their respective MOOCs or uh, e-learning platforms. And this is something that we're trying to avoid. We're trying to build something uh, which will allow people to gather knowledge in one place while keeping it peer reviewed, uh, while keeping it you know, factually true, <laughs> which is probably the most important thing about knowledge, and by keeping it open and by allowing everyone, not just the academics, to, all, to participate while not excluding anyone per se. And um, a lot of rights that come with free education are related to copyleft, and the copyleft itself can help um, access to getting access to knowledge to a lot of people, especially in underdeveloped countries. Uh, so the state of current education, um, I'm aware that um, some people are you know, representatives of universities, but um, there's this overwhelming institutionalization of knowledge. And this is happening throughout the Western world. Um, most of the knowledge, uh, research, you know, something that would be um, 
categorized as um, valuable for societal progress is keep, kept in academia still. So um, different parts of this also affect high schools and elementary schools, like copyleft awareness. Not a lot of teachers know that copyleft exists and how they treat the resources that they have and that they're producing and they're using uh, while teaching. And then there's you know, um, licensing awareness of any kind of the material they produce or they try to create. Is it reusable? Can someone remix it? Um, OERs are specifically um, a project, open educational resources, um, that got some traction in the EU and in the US. Uh, but in the EU, it mostly uh, fell down to uh, something that's project funded, and it's uh, been done in that manner throughout um, the whole educational system. Open access is something that I love to discuss too. Um, it implies you know, free access to uh, research and journaling. Um, a lot of what we have today is, as an implementation of free software, is uh, researchers self-archiving their work in open journals. Um, and then, of course, people are usually not aware that sometimes even their work is not their ownership. Sometimes universities, institutes, and different, um, different institutions can actually take credit or take ownership of their, their work. Um, so the institutional implementation of copyleft boils down to Creative Commons. It's not predominant. It's not widespread. But uh, Creative Commons provides a good basis to start working uh, on copyleft integration into this sector. Non-institutional implementation is second to none. Most of these MOOCs, most of these platforms do not really address copyright or copyleft in any way, uh, except for the declarative copyright um, copyright notices on the, the courses that people sell, uh, but they are um, crowdsourced, which is something that uh, could be addressed today. And um, there are also some limitations of copyleft in the institutions, uh, especially in the US, where for-profit journals are sometimes favorable for researchers um, than, than actually uh, licensing as copyleft um, of, of this work. So, Another thing that I, I'd like to discuss with you today is, is copyleft the means to access knowledge and to allow everyone to access knowledge? Is this something that, you know, the, 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 the structure of legality of the content that we have, uh, is this something that can be solved through copyleft? Um, is copyleft a means of starting a new movement on non-institutional research, and how can we educate people who are not in academia to pursue research in a different manner than we have in academia right now, to, um, in part, copy left. Um, crowdsourcing is an extremely um, hard, difficult thing to achieve properly, so copy left can actually help implementation of peer reviews, uh, can help implementation of the, the software frameworks that can help manage um, ownership, manage copyright, manage uh, the whole workflows of how we get this knowledge into a singular um, open um, corpuses. And of course, um, there is a predominant problem now with the software that we use to manage these attributions and not all other requirements of these licenses, which is also something that's happening in free software. Um, and thinking about how we can solve this for educational content, um, I think is, is very related to free software also. Uh, so these are the topics that I'd like to talk to you about, uh, some background about me. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to open the discussion. Uh, so it sounds like you're mostly focusing on research and uh, paper uh, as your main focus for applying copyleft, uh, but there's a lot of things in uh, earlier education, specifically in uh, pre-K through you know high school, where there's uh, a lot of materials uh, and resources that 
are follow a similar structure where the, the creators are you know, naturally siloed because they don't either know how to share it or that there are potentially others out there that, that could benefit from that. Uh, so have you taken into consideration uh, applications outside of just the research aspect and how that, how copyleft could benefit, uh, you know, education through all ages? Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a really good question. So Zamfir primarily focuses on informal education, actually. So not a lot of work uh, from our side has been done on research and journaling and, and, and things like that. Uh, what we try to do is we're trying to, to build uh, the software that would actually run these things and then allow you know, different institutions to actually use it. Uh, with the philosophy that it is, um, we are trying to get this knowledge um, in, in a single place basically, but in a distributed manner. So the, the most efficient thing for us was to find a certain uh, industry where we could actually try and test these, uh, these premises you know, in, in, in real life. And we started with computer science. So most of what we do is we produce content and work with communities of hackers you know, and, and, and uh, different people, not just in tech, to get computer science education, generally you know, hacking education of any kind, um, tutorials, as you might call them in a, in a commercial setting, in one place and trying to refine these things. So it's very non-institutional. We have you know, approached different uh, um, universities in Europe. We had mixed feedback, uh, but we do cooperate with many high schools, for example. Um, we try to keep this 16 and above because the the all of the implications that we have with you know, educating minors and you know, children, there is a lot of more complexity you know, with the pedag pedagogy that, that's, you know, that goes into like, early um, education. But we're trying to keep this at a level of high schools and we've had a lot of success with that. So I wouldn't say our, our goal was to focus on the, um, the research and the academic research, yeah. So it, um, it seems to me that this, is, this doesn't sound like more of a technical challenge or it, it's my perception or a license challenge more than a perception in general of leaving out the uh, uh, power that the perception of that the power is in, is with the institutionalized part of the education right now so the majority of the in my experience the majority of the, of the people that are the decision makers in uh, in the educational system in general would like to have this you know, their own the, for them to be their own thing of who decides what is right for to teach and what is not so do you think um, what would you think it's the biggest challenge in, in your perspective in your perspective is this the is the change of mentality or is it a technical issue in terms of the software that you're building um, with our project most of this comes from you know we're the first ones to actually say okay we have free we want something that's called free education but unrelated to that, copyleft in itself, um, I think the problem is um, the difference culturally, um, you know, between countries, between you know, different people from different cities, um, influences a lot of this decision making that people have toward how do they license content. Uh, for example, op open educational resources are very dominant in in Europe, but they're developed mostly um, through project funding. And a, a lot of work that goes into open textbooks, um, resources, you know, self-archiving is basically paid for by the EU. So when we analyze this, we realize that they don't really take into consideration the, the license that they, <laughs> they're going to use because it's mostly uh, Creative Commons and that's it. But the problem that, that, that we've found is even producing content outside of the, the institution um, takes this to a different level of, um, I, I, I wouldn't know how to describe it, as if the copyleft, as if the licensing is not a thing. So we usually have non-institutional uh, 
let's say a company who sells horses, right? Um, they don't think they don't think of copyleft. They don't take it in, into consideration, and there is no inherent um, motivation for them to actually take that into consideration. And that's one of the reasons we started this project is that universities tend to kind of uh, be closed up, no matter how much you know they think they're not. Uh, it's it's a very closed up system, and. Um, Depending on the, the, the society you live in, right, the, the culture, the country, history, there are people who are not able to access knowledge even with, with a widespread network of universities, right? So we started this as a, as a way of providing non-institutional uh, non -institutional education, and we, we've seen that licensing is not something that people think about. So the awareness of, you know, hey, copyleft exists, this is how it works, is something that needs to, you know, that's something that communities need to work on. But uh, governments and people in governments have, you know, the knowledge of it, but sometimes, and usually that's the case, they're not willing or they're not interested in actually pursuing these, these you know, campaigns or pursuing any kind of change structurally because there's an inherent communication, there's some kind of an understanding between universities in most European countries, for example, that you know, things are as they are, the funding has been set. Um, I'm hoping that this, is, this will uh, change with um, Plan S, the Coalition S, so this should be a, a huge change in, in the EU. Um, it's called a Plan S, so I think the EU is, is trying to restructure higher education I think they're, they're looking for ways of how to actually expand, you know, how to change that, that nature of universities in Europe. Um, they've been uh, planning for this to happen by 2023. So I'm hoping that copyleft and crowdsourcing and actually getting these things more into the, the, the masses would help um, even with the licensing itself. Um, you know, people from Eastern Europe have have the concept of people's universities, right? So th th that was um, that was a, a good opportunity for people for like vocational studies, for example. So uh, just a comment from my side. Not sure where it will lead to. Something interesting is happening in my country in terms of uh, education about programming, computer science in in this field. There's a lot of demand for uh, knowledgeable people, workforce, and all the universities in the country basically suck. Uh, so there's a lot of private organizations, mo mostly for-profit, a few non -pro not for profit as well, who, who provide education, they provide courses uh, about programming, and, and all the materials that they have are basically on GitHub. So we've got like just uh, homework tasks, training tasks, uh, to-do lists for readme, uh, there's also even books written, and you can also buy these same books in print, and they are also on GitHub. Uh, you can use them in this format if you will. Uh, what I do is I also do a lot of training uh, in-house for companies. Uh, I've taken some resources from these, uh, academy, we call them academies, so I incorporate this in my training. On the other hand, a lot of the training that I develop uh, for myself, it's also on GitHub, so I've, I've seen a few people take from that as well. And it becomes a huge mix of, you know, like knowledge resource which gets incorporated into different formats. Um, not sure if this is good or bad. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I've seen, so depending on where you're from, your response to like uh, liberating knowledge or taking this out of the institutions and academia varies a lot. I, I've seen people from the U.S. being, you know, extremely happy about it and extremely upset about it, um, depending on, you know, the sector of the university that they, they have. Um, you know, in the U.S., a lot of universities are for-profit universities or not for-profit, but they do accumulate a lot of a lot of wealth um, as a as a you know as a as a thing as, as something that they do. Depending on where you're from, um, I'm from Serbia. Uh, many of our universities have declined in quality uh, in the last 20 years. And um, as a result of that, or as a, as a response to that, I've seen people 
try to do something like that. Um, a lot of resources that are very, uh, so computer science is actually a good example because a lot of people tend to uh, work in this industry and they're following the, the latest trends and then they're trying to keep up with the mainstream. But the universities are actually not providing that. And um, that, was a, that, that used to be a problem five years ago and now universities uh, in some countries are saying, well, we don't want to teach you the latest thing. We'll give you the fundamentals and then you learn it yourself. So now they've, they've uh, kind of recognized that there's no way for them in a current format with the, the bureaucracy and curriculums and things like that um, to keep up with these things. Um, sometimes professors, um, assistants, teaching assistants, go out of their, their ways to actually help people, but it's, it's private initiative, right? To help people understand new technology. So what we have as a problem is the curriculum can change because you know it has, and uh, uh, there's a plan, there is a timeline where that needs to happen, how long that takes. There are stakeholders, so it's not easy. And the way I think personally, and what Zamfir does is actually trying to liberate education off curriculums, but that's not going to be effective in academic setting, right? Um, that's not something that academia will will give up easily. Um, most of my work started with computer science and most of it is non-institutional non because you know, universities, uh, high schools very rarely provide something uh, valuable in the industry. Um, even digital literacy um, is a problem amongst you know, people 25 and above, <laughs> even 25 uh, younger people uh, sometimes because they are consumers, right? Uh, so not a lot of curricula are adapted to allow them to learn about these things. Is there any good example of a country or city that is embracing this? Yeah, repeat the question. Yeah, is there is there any example of a country or a city? Yeah. It, it, yeah. So is there any country or or city that that's adopting this philosophy of? Of free education, I, I don't think so. Not as of yet. Uh, there are a few initiatives that help with uh, extracurricular work, and that is going on. My personal um, personal knowledge is that uh, there are a few initiatives in Munich. Um, there is one good initiative in Shanghai, which is applied to uh, all of uh, state um, high schools, and it gets. Uh, you know, young adults and children into technology by experimenting, by you know, reversing the methods of uh, of learning. So something that they do not get in school, they flip um, flip the tables and then try to um, you know trial and error. A lot of these are not really you know something that someone who's really proficient in, in pedagogy would say yeah, this is a good idea, but. Uh, it gets people, um, you know, throw them into the fire and see what happens. Like maybe they'll, maybe they'll find their way. Um, I think the problem with with um, the curricula is that it enforces schools to do a certain thing. Uh, it enforces a certain set of lectures, a certain set of materials, and that's something that in our world increasingly digital world is not something that you know we ideally want because we want to teach people how to learn on their own and not rely on on you know the accreditation that they have uh, a license that if you will a license of knowledge Presumably one, one problem is this curriculum, that if it says the curriculum is this and it is a textbook supplied by the state, then you cannot have a free equivalent because the definition is that is the curriculum. You have to buy that official copy. Whereas if the curriculum is a list of things, teaching must include overview of this, overview of this, overview of this, you are able to make a free software implementation. Is that understanding correct? So if, 
if we look at uh, if we look at copyleft, it you know it's a it's a nice tool to allow you to produce any kind of work uh, educational material that you would present uh, independently. And um, when we started working on Zamfir, our goal was to provide open textbooks. And then we came to this realization that you know <laughs> no matter what we do, this is going to basically be you know producing the same content that the state already has and provides just licensing it for free, which doesn't really allow you to do anything. Um, in most countries, uh, students can actually, can't actually pick the textbook. So even if we were to give the, uh, a printed copy to them, they wouldn't be able to use it um, because they, they would have to take the one that was mandated. Um, one thing that I've found is, uh, me personally, I'm against curriculum as a, as a, as a notion in education. It did make sense. Uh, but now I'm 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 trying to trying to look at different options, uh, so to say. One option is this crowdsourced open knowledge corpus, which, if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia sort of does that from a from a different perspective, right? Um, and I don't remember anyone saying, you know, Wikipedia is not going to work. Uh, we have a problem that um, education is a very touchy subject. Uh, we have a lot of people who are in academia. Um, they respect the system. Uh, they are part of the system. And the very notion of changing it so fundamentally doesn't really compute with them in a way that it should. We've, we have had mixed, uh, mixed feedback. For me, if you want to share knowledge, uh, building a singular knowledge corpus for everybody on the planet sounds ridiculous when you say it like that, <laughs> but is a viable option because we can implement formats that allow people to have discussions, to fork different opinions, um, to present different opinions, to present different versions of what happened in industry, to, you know, to present their personal opinions that do not have to be quantifiably true. And then keep this as a format where, um, as a corpus, as something that everybody can get access to. This would mean that there are no more textbooks. And this would mean that you could build a curriculum, but it wouldn't be of any value anymore. So when, when you say that you're against curriculum and it wouldn't be of any value, in your opinion, I kind of don't agree. In, in my opinion, from what I've seen, people trying to, for instance, study programming where they come from no technical background, uh, all the information that they need is actually out there on the internet. It's already copy, copylefted. So a lot of uh, Creative Commons, GPL and stuff like that. A lot of free courses as well, all the open source is GPL mostly. And their biggest trouble is that there's too much information. They don't know how to structure the learning. And that's why they need curriculum. That's why they need a teacher to help them, guide them through all the basic knowledge that they need to have so they can like reach a level where they can explore themselves and learn. And a lot of the times as well, what I see is uh, people are afraid to experiment on their own. They're like mentalities okay, what, what is going to happen if I do this in my like, homework assignment? And I'm always saying, try and see. Either it works or it fails. If it fails, try debugging. If it's a computer program, figure it out why it fails or figure out why it works. And then you will learn a, a lot more. And people are generally afraid of doing this. Yeah, we actually started with, uh, with the premise that the, the content for teaching people how to code, for example. I don't think that there's any topic uh, on the internet that has more resources available to people, um, especially with the uh, abundance of material being created every day for the purpose of being sold to people. Uh, we have companies like Udemy um, and even nonprofits like edX and uh, Coursera that do make money off of these things. And there's a, there's a wide variety of, of material available. Uh, but I wouldn't agree that curriculum is the same as structured learning. Um, when we start working on this, 
we, we, we got to the same point very fast, uh, is that if you leave a person with a, with a Google open or any kind of different non-tracking um, search engine, you're going, to, you're going to see less results than you might expect because people don't know, don't know where to start. Uh, but the problem with the curriculum is that it doesn't allow them to, um, it sort of normalizes education. Uh, curriculum implies that even if you can go above and beyond, you can't in a formal way, right? That's one problem with the curriculum. Another one is that with, with you know, conventional offline education, you have this um, classroom average that every teacher, every professor has to keep in mind. Um, that's, that's a bit different in the U.S. because, you know, professors in the U.S. are, are very, um, they teach very differently uh, to, to what you see in Europe. Uh, but if you have to think about the average of a classroom, you're basically, again, normalizing the aptitude of people to, to grasp what you're saying, uh, the speed, the agility. That, you know. um, so I think the curriculum is inherently non-free in terms of education. And I, I see that uh, teachers are, are reacting in a, in a certain way, saying, well, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> what are you doing? You know, uh, I think that inherently all educational materials should be made for self-education, uh, but teachers should not be, you know, left out of this. I think that teachers should be co-creators of knowledge. They should be mentors to people. They should be the ones providing structure, but with this overwhelming uh, burden of actually presenting knowledge and presenting the educational materials, now lifted off of them, they would be able to be you know, the co-creators of knowledge, provide structure to people, don't allow them to just waste time, maybe you know, push them out of their comfort zone to actually you know, achieve some trial and error success with, with the similar uh, things you mentioned, yeah. There's been a bit of interest recently about um, learning where, where you have, where the connection or relevance to a real product is, is there. So this is like Elon Musk pushes this and other people as well. Um, where you learn something in the process of having a goal rather than just learning for the sake of learning. Is it worth putting the time and effort into constructing these situations and, and possibly using that as the way to transition to copyleft teaching materials, rather than just replicating curriculums and textbooks and stuff. <laughs> so active learning uh, is, is, I think, one of the best, uh, very, something that people easily relate to. Uh, you start doing, you start working, and then in the process of this, you, you, you know, you're getting schooled. <laughs> this, this works in, in this way, and uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Some things are not something they can do with active learning. For example, medical science is definitely not something that you can allow people to pull around. Yeah. So it's easier with, with non-critical things like programming. Do you think so? I don't want to get us completely off track, but I would say there's very good evidence that anything you can think of that you want people to learn, there's an active approach that's much, much better than a traditional passive approach. How would that apply to medical science, for example? I mean, you can have an active learning activity that doesn't involve cutting up a living body, right? Medical schools have done things with cadavers for hundreds of years. Right? Why do they do that? Because it's active learning, because it helps people understand. Yes, I'm obviously not the main expert in, in a lot of these things. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, active learning, it makes a lot of sense for non-critical things. And even some critical things, um, like medical science, might be even with a simulation or, or things like that. We, we do have a lot of technology that allows us to do these things today without actually you know, <laughs> working with cadavers or that's for living people. Um, but the, the problem with, with this, the state of education today is not 
the way we learn. There, there are a few uh, movements like open pedagogy, which will try to help teachers um, to apply different methods of teaching and try to uh, decompose how you know, children especially are acquiring knowledge. And they are not really widespread yet. Um, education always has this tendency to fall back 10 to 20 years with technology and adoption and a lot of these things. Um, I think that the biggest problem with, with copyleft is that copyleft works really well in a collaborative environment, right? So if you pay someone to build a free textbook and you don't allow any input from the side, then it doesn't really, it matters, but it doesn't really get, you know, it doesn't really allow copyleft to show the value of licensing this. And crowdsourcing, if you think about it, how many things in, in life you learn, you know, outside of an institution, there are a lot of things you learn from on the street, from other people, unrelated to school. And um, there is a, there's a big potential in actually crowdsourcing knowledge from, you know, from people into, into some kind of a repository. And copyleft is a good tool to actually allow that. Because if you don't have a legal tool, um, Adam Schwartz is a good example of what happens. You have universities who you know, try to build knowledge and pay for you know, research and store it, archive it, but it's not really free in money and in freedom. Um, if you have to pay for it $10, that presents a huge barrier, um, even for you know, even for people in America, and you can imagine how that you know translates to different countries around the world. So copyleft can actually help access to knowledge in that way, uh, and then if if we build a model of of education that can actually implement copyleft and crowdsourcing in one way, and then pedagogy in a different way, we might be able to. Um, to build something that, uh, some kind of an education that's free, um, legally free. Um, you know, we have Library Genesis, we have Sci-Hub, and people who've built that are now, you know, hiding, they're, they're prosecuted because they've released uh, research to the world without, without pay. And this is funded, so these things are funded. You actually have, so in Europe you have like open access journals, and a lot of researchers in Europe are, are self-archiving to these journals. But then there's a, an economy around it. And I personally believe that education and economy shouldn't be mixing together. But if, if you have some kind, of a, some kind of a journal and you're charging money to actually get, get some, some research or paper published, you're creating an economy around these things. And then you know people who are publishing Universities who are publishing papers are thinking, well, we're going to need funding for this. So I think that copyleft can actually help us with that primary problem with, with, um, with the learning material is that sometimes there is not enough and sometimes there's too much, but it's bad. Um, if you look at non-institutional learning, Udemy, for example, people who learn about computing programming and these things, um, they try and pay for their courses and they try to learn, but they don't re really know if this information, if this uh, education that they're paying for is good enough. Is it, you know, is it valid? Is it true? Uh, because it's not peer-reviewed. And my premise is that if we would have open knowledge corpuses, all of these things would be peer-reviewed. So even if I'm wrong, I would be easily corrected, uh, and that would scale not to two or three people that were paid to review it. Uh, that's also an ethical question, uh, where, where copyleft could also help. But you know, anyone who's willing to join, and that's only you now the barrier doesn't you know doesn't come with money, doesn't come with you know your educational status or your academic engagement. It comes with are you interested in actually seeing anything? So I think that copyleft. Um, can be a valuable tool for this. 
So where I'm based right now, there are big student protests for since December, and I was checking the, their demands. And it was weird because one of the main demands one ac was access to um, having journals from uh, specific universities and uh, other. So for me, it doesn't make any sense that, uh, like me and other people, we pay taxes, but uh, uh, students do not have either the basic uh, basis access to the to this kind of journals. Uh, or what? I'm not. I don't know the details, like what kind of journals and uh, where, but. Um, I was checking also that this was also demand with, uh, to other, from other students in other countries, not, def not Central Europe mainly. So it's, it's very weird in 2019 to, have, to, uh, to, act, to request the basic access to what other people have produced with other taxpayers' money uh, in other countries of the world because usually what the argument is, you, you said you can mix financial elements with education or not. Um, even if you, s I don't agree with this, but even if you agree with this, uh, I think the financial concept is that if you pay for something, you should get it. And since a lot of people pay with their taxes worldwide, I think the students also should have the access to this, um, to this kind of information or knowledge. Just quick add-on to this. Uh, there's been a few countries uh, in Europe, not, not that many, that just recently they adopted like open source l laws for or like public facing IT systems and stuff like that. And although they have the legislation, I think only the UK has, has actually been doing something practical about it. Uh, so maybe that's something that can translate to university as well. So one of the things that, you know, it's visible that uh, your opinions and, and you know my opinions too, and uh, all of our opinions, uh, very, you know, are, are very linked to where we're from <laughs> and uh, how we think about education and what we have. So especially, you know, you, you're, you're from Albania, I'm from Serbia, and, and, and Alexander is from Bulgaria, and then we have this different, um, different idea of what education should be and how it was before. And uh, it was free, it was open, it was, it was, it was a bit different to, to what we have right now. If you have taxpayers um, paying for college, and you may, might not have this capacity of, you know, institutional research being done inside the country. We, we, you know, it's, it's 2019, we have machine learning um, algorithms that can translate a lot of these things, but you don't have access to them. So if, if a university has to pay for uh, a different university's um, journal, it's basically, you know, you're selling papers, right? That's, what I, that's why I'm saying, you know, I don't like the idea of this, this education and healthcare being a commodity, right? I don't like this being sold. Um, because y you do not have inherent, um, especially in, in Europe where most of, you know, respectable, reputable universities are state-owned, um, you don't have an inherent cost of developing these papers your whole education is paid for by the state. You're using taxpayers' money for every part of the infrastructure that you're using. And, you know, you've been giving a lot of given a lot of things. So getting, <laughs> getting this, yeah. So, one, only one comment. So, so again, I agree with you, but even if I don't agree, I would insist that there is, there are all these laws that make it Easy and agreements, worldwide agreements, to make it easier for me to get a USB cable from uh, AliExpress for two dollars easily, but there is no agreement or there is no will to have this kind of freedom of transfer of knowledge from one country to the other, and that doesn't make any sense. Again, because a lot of people are paying their dues to wherever they are living worldwide. So for me, what, there is no argument there. The education should be accessible, even if you believe in one system where education is one of the few elements that should be free, or if you believe that it should be a commodity. Again, this, it, we have paid for it in one way or the other. Yeah, it, it's just mildly amusing that everything is publicly funded until you need to publish the paper at which you have to pay a private company to do that. 
and then the next person has to pay the private company to access the copy of the paper in the journal, despite the rest of their work being publicly funded. Hmm. The, the thing that I noticed in the last few months which was affecting me was that I needed to learn a new foreign language. And there's always the question, okay, so which online resource is best, which learning program is best? And you have things like Duolingo, which are better than other things there, but that's sort of a proprietary corpus of learning material. And if we had an engine, like an online learning engine, of which there are probably several, and these open corpuses of material, this, this would solve, solve a, a lot of things. Like, if I could contribute it somewhere where it had traction, sorted. Have you got a solution to that? The core idea of this came from free software, right? And uh, if you look at languages, this is a perfect example. Anyone who speaks a language can be a contributor. There is no barrier to entry. Um, there was often a discussion of um, post-scarcity societies, right? And how do we start universal basic income, this or that, you know? But no. You have to build... Um, that fundamental thing, and we recognize that education is a fundamental thing in, us, in our society, access to knowledge, because that allows people to transcend, you know, in, in you know, these sadder parts of the world, their castes, their, you know, classes, their you know, living environment change um, when people get access to knowledge. Uh, yeah, and you, <coughs> sorry. You have a right to education. Well, we do not use the same principles that we preach. And that's why, you know, I, I was, my, my motivation for starting uh, to talk about free education is, was that. Um, if you want a post-scarcity world, the knowledge is the first thing that, you know, you shouldn't be bogging down. Um, if you look at open journals, for example, companies that used to take, um, papers, and you, know, you, you obviously have to pay for this paper to be published, but not only that, you have to transfer copyright to these companies. You're transferring ownership to these companies, and this model doesn't work in, in countries that have like, moral rights as part of their copyright law, uh, which is you know, luckily the case in Europe mostly. Um, and this is the German model. So if you have moral rights, you know, you can transfer fully all rights to your work to some company. And now companies like Elsevier will, you know, start working on, have actually started working on an open journal. So if we allow this to happen, the interpretation of what's open and what's free will vary um, immensely, yeah. So this is, this is something that we need to work on. And this is something that I feel as, as, a, as someone who, you know, I, I devoted myself to, to, to these principles of free education, is I, I think that we need to set a few rules, and one rule and one principle is that this uh, copy left can help uh, with the materials because we do have inherent access to the material if we, if we do copy left. And then there's no limitation, for example, if, um, We've been working with interns from Sudan, for example. They have been you know, um, in that position right now where they're banned from the internet, in a sense, because US foreign, uh, US foreign policy you know, finds them un, um, unwelcome for some kind. So they have a lot of online resources printed out, previously translated to Arabic or French, print it out and they can use it. The legality is somewhat questionable, but in, in that position, you know, copy left material would allow them if they don't have access to internet and a lot of places in the world don't have access to uh, electricity the whole day, they could be, you know, legally allowed to print these things and distribute them, you know, in any way they, they like. So I think that copy left it should be one um, one part of this very well written and very um, precise definition of what open education is, because free education 
actually. Because if we allow uh, this to be a, a thing of interpretation, we, we all know how that goes. <laughs> Okay, I think we, we all, all of us in this room basically agree with each other because we come from the same background. Uh, and there, there's been, throughout the years, many projects that try to solve the same problem from different perspective. So we remember one laptop per child. Uh, I remember at, at some point in time, there was some like something like a USB dongle with all the Wikipedia and everything offline and that you may need. Uh, and these were successful in, in like in the in the proof of concepts that I did. But my question is, what do teachers think about that? How they, how they are involved in all this thing that you say? So I think we are missing the teachers here. As part of what, what Serbian government is doing right now is that they're trying to get ahead of Europe for, for change and implement, <laughs> implement this uh, digital education and, and actually learning about computer science as part of their curricula, right? And um, we've been talking to people. Now we have this um, in elementary and high schools. And because I come from this background of non-institutional learning, um, I tend to focus more on um, young adults and, and kids like 16 to, to 20 years, so you know, pretty young, to try to um, help them get that additional material that they need to learn things that they can't get access to in school, right? And the teachers are overwhelmingly uh, excited about this uh, because not only is it making their job easier, but it allows them to transcend their own like limit of what they know. Uh, right now, in, um, and that's a very practical thing, because we don't share, we fragment knowledge all over the place. So, for example, we've, we've been talking to, to people in Albania and there are 1,400 schools so teachers in these schools are producing knowledge every day. You know, none of the teachers are reading their books. There are things that are not written in books, there are th things not written in textbooks that they have to convey to, to students. So they're doing this every day. And every day they repeat that cycle, go home, and, and this knowledge is never combined. This knowledge is never refined. Uh, we are capped by the ability of the teacher and their knowledge and what they know because we don't share, right? So if you look at, like, if you look at teachers, uh, what they see is, okay, this is, this is one place, and that, that's why I'm insisting on centralizing this, although in, you know, in network and security you always try to decentralize everything that you can, we do need to centralize knowledge but distribute it equally, right? Because teachers will see this all-in-one solution and their access to knowledge will be virtually unlimited and they would be in that, in that way able to provide um, guidance, mentorship to their students because they wouldn't be um, limited to only the resources that they own. So it was a, it's, uh, the responses from them are very positive. Are you tired? <laughs> yeah, I, I just realized that the discussion is intended to run for an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. And uh, the discussion is intended on the timetable to run for an hour and 20 minutes, and that's quite exhausting, even for me as a participant at the back row. Um, uh, I can share something uh, from about 10 years ago. My, probably my last encounter with teachers that didn't go so well like you described. Back then we had one laptop per child project and we tried to conv convince a few local schools in Sofia that we we're going to find funding to buy the, the actual hardware. Uh, we're, we're, we were not asking them for money, we were just asking them to do the pilot project. Uh, just basically tell them, okay, this is translated in the local language, all the materials, all the programs. Just you know, give it to give it to the kids, and just help them learn. And they they were very against that. Uh, haven't actually figured out why exactly. Uh, back then, we we focused more on the technical side of things and didn't think too much about the educational side of things. So it's also part of part of our mistake. 
Uh, but yes, teacher, teachers were very against that, and especially uh, high school uh, directors very, very much against that. Is it is the the fear of loss of control, the, or is it sort of the fear of loss of uh, the fear of change that I don't understand this new technology or every kid in the classroom has a laptop but I don't. Uh, or, or do, do you simply not know, even to this day, what the... So, I, I mostly don't know. I mean, it could be fear of losing control, fear of losing their job, or maybe fear of... Uh, we come from a post-communist society, so maybe fear of, like, doing something different, which is not allowed, but it's on the same... At the same time, it's not strictly forbidden as well. Uh, but in, I, I was too inexperienced back then to, to actually go on ahead and ask, okay, why, why do you do this? Why do you not allow this to happen? So I, I do a lot of workshops with mostly college, but also K-12 teachers. So here are several thoughts. Um, I think one thought is those people are working very hard and not being paid very well, right? If, if you're in the school for six or eight hours and every hour you have 30 kids and then you get home and that's, that's when you start grading, preparing materials. So it, 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 we're lucky that we have as many good teachers as we do. I think Part of the problem with technology is, fine, you've given me a piece of technology, you know, I'm, I'm giving you an x-ray machine, but you're not a doctor, <laughs> right? So you put the x-ray machine and use it as a table, and so I think part of it is they're being given technology, but not the training and how to use it. Part of it is there's probably some fear, uncertainty. I think there's also an issue of, you know, if a teacher came to you and said, well, you've written this software program, it would really be easier for me if it just did this. And it's, it's just, to me, it looks like a very simple change. So it's very easy for those of us that know technology but don't understand education to think, oh, <laughs> I've given you a laptop, why hasn't it transformed your classroom? Well. You know, I've told you the problem with your software company, why haven't you fixed it? <laughs> Many of these things uh, that happen with governments, for example, are trying to um, leverage the, you know, the authority that they have and transfer all the, the, the you know, the engagement and the, the overall uh, work to teachers. So especially with, with these new initiatives where you'd you know, provide a computer or provide some piece of hardware, they do provide it, but then they stop thinking about it. So you as a teacher, you had this load that you had to like, endure and you had to work, and now you know, you're added. Because governments usually procure, procure these things with um, different, different um, they, they think structurally about, okay, this is an improvement because we added things. But you know, teachers don't look at it like that way. Teachers look at like, how can we make our, our jobs easier? And um, it's not a bad thing, right? If you buy a laptop and you put it in a classroom, no one from the state will come and say, okay, this is how it works and we're going to manage it for you. No, they say, the teacher's gonna do it. And that's usually the case. Many of the digitization pro uh, projects failed because no matter how much training you, you uh, assign or do with teachers, teachers are simply not willing to, to do that work because not only do they have to teach, now they have to be server administrators, they have to be you know, coders, they have to be, a lot of these things are, are happening that way, you know, manage devices, sometimes even you know, with devices, um, teachers would be responsible for the devices themselves. You know, and that's something that they do not want to think about. One thing is like open, um, no, one laptop per child uh, was specifically a bad project in, in one way that it promised a $100 laptop, but what they delivered was significantly more expensive and not as powerful as it was. And in a way it was futureware. 
Um, only five years after that, you have CHIP or the NTC, Next Thing Corp, which also failed, but they managed to build a $9 computer, so a $9 retail computer. And you have this company that's trying to build a laptop for $100, you know, in 2010, 2011, and then they deliver something that costs 350. For that, that much money, you can actually buy any kind of laptop for, for a child, right? Um, so I think some, some of these initiatives came too early with the, the whole future where uh, we want a fast chip, we want a fast laptop, something that's going to be use, usable, but we are kind of early five years on, right? Um, so I think that's, that's the failure of that. And um, what I think is that uh, when we design software, we should be designing something that's um, manageable from the outside, not just from the inside. So if you build some kind of a implementation of free education, and if you want to build a free school, you do not need to you know, bother teachers with that. That should be something that's organic. And because education, state-ran education is not organic, it's very uh, structural and very authoritative, they just say, okay, this is the way it works. This is the way it worked 100 years ago, and we're just gonna add laptops. <laughs> And you always have more paperwork and you always have, you know, it's not related to teaching itself, but you know, always more paperwork, always more, more, more to do. And now you have this whole subset of, you know, devices and digital things you have to know about, you have to manage, you have to, you know, it's, it's, I don't think that's the way to go. Uh, I think that many of the, many, many children today have their phones, they have devices. We should be working towards providing software um, that can help manage and restructure education as we know it right now. Uh, maybe provide some cheap compute power for their homes, um, extremely cheap computers that they wouldn't have to you know, carry around, something that works with batteries, something that, that's not really, you know, that doesn't really work only in, in the developed world. But schools are not really eager to adopt like mobile phones as a tool for instruction. Right? or to, for learning, because you know, states can't spend money on it because you already have it, which is sometimes the main motivation for projects like that is you know, a few people in the government asking themselves, how can we spend more public money? And all of the things that go with that. Um, Why do you think the public doesn't react against the government when they try to spend huge amounts of public money, especially for education. And I can give you an example from Bulgaria, just from last year. Uh, in the end of November, we had three billion deficit, and by the end of December, that was gone. So they spent three billion for one month because it was the end of the year. And just nobody cared. Like, hardly any protest, hardly any comment in the media, nothing. So depending on where you're from, um, I see that a lot of governments have really opaque mechanisms for doing things. Even in, in Europe, in the EU, you'd see governments doing something and then announcing that it's being done. And now you know, you're already in the process of this implementation of these things. So they keep discussion and they keep a lot of these things very, um, well, not closed, but very inaccessible, right? So this is a mechanism of actually excluding the public. That's why I'm saying, you know, free education. Um, it's, uh, that depends. You know, that's that's more of a political issue because when you look at it, like, is it is it that the time to protest? If you if you have a mechanism of of actually stopping this, wouldn't it be better to do it at the beginning? Just you know. You know, you have public discussions and you have a lot of these things. So that basically boils down to like if these governments are, are working in public interest, right? Um, usually they don't. Uh, usually you have people do, that do not think about education philosophically, more of a mechanical uh, way of thinking where, you know, procurement is being, you know, assigned from year to year or buying new computers. Um, in some countries, Serbia is a good example, you have 
for-profit entities like Microsoft's who are funding, you know, lobby groups to actually stop free software from being adopted in, in education. And, you know, education, as we've seen, is a very packed topic and it has a lot of different, you know, different uh, angles we have to look at. But just getting the access to free software and free education to people is going to prove to be a very hard thing, n unrelated to how, like, how the instruction uh, is going to be made, what, what methodology is going to be used in pedagogy and, and all of these things. Um, political issues in education are something that's unavoidable uh, in free software also, but much to, to a much lesser extent than this. So, you know, one step at a time. I think implementing copyleft as a mandatory policy for all, the, all these things that uh, are state-funded or non-institutional and then just structuring them in, in, in common corpuses can lead to uh, a, a domino effect with, with education because things will have to change. Uh, that's something that free software also recognized and implemented. We have five minutes, so yeah. So last question. Uh, I think it, it took about 20 years for, for free software to take off. How, how much time do you think for free education will take off? Depends if I work on it. <laughs> uh, 50 years maybe, I don't know. Uh, this, this, is, um, this is a fairly new thing. Uh, what we're trying to do is to see what works, especially in free software, because free software is a good guideline for these things. Obviously, you know, I can't go to a teacher and tell them how to do their job. I can just philosophically implement something that they might or might not like. <laughs> but as a teacher, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a legislator. I can't, you know, I can try to influence that. But free education is probably gonna be harder to implement than free software because uh, it has more implications. It's very, um, low uh, level in terms of the platform that we call society. So changing that will change, you know, all of the things that are built on top of it. So I, I'm, I'm really not sure. Okay, any more questions, uh, thoughts, ideas? Very quick one to end. A few hundred years ago, you used to have guilds where craftsmen and craftswomen of the same profession met to keep their techniques secret, so the opposite of education. And it's the patent system that was introduced to try and break that power by saying, okay, if one of you breaks rank from the guild, I'll give you a limited monopoly of 10 or 20 years as long as you write down the secret. And the patent system was introduced to try and break the secrecy of the guilds. I wonder if you could do the same for... <laughs> yeah, unlock it. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you everyone. I'll make a few notes if anyone wants to participate in that. Um, I'd, I'd be, I'd love that. <laughs> uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for